Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. Hope it's going great for everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with the both of us here today, make sure you hit that subscribe button, both on YouTube and the podcast side of things. Check out my Twitter at Focus Compound and go over to FocusCompounding.com uh, to sign up to uh, see what Jeff's been writing about uh, when it comes to stocks. And if you don't want to sign up, there is a free content section. We have over, I was telling Jeff this the other day, it's like 645 posts okay. on the free content section. All right. That's a lot going all the way back to 2005. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get your MBA in uh, investing, that's what some people said when I tweeted about it, go to focuscompound.com and hit that free content section. You don't even have to sign up and you can get access to everything. So in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about banks. Okay. We talk a lot about banks. I was just telling you that banks are probably one of the most interesting industries to me. I know they are to you as well. Because there's a lot of them, including a lot of small ones. Yeah, there's just more choices. My favorite thing is when I like Google a bank mm -hmm. and it gives the founded date. It's like okay. 1850, 1860, yeah, there's some, 1880. There's some very old banks, sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, banks, and you always get an example, like banks can be around for hundreds of years. Sure, and insurers too, yeah. Yeah. Um, and people really love to hear you speak about it, I think because banks are complicated and a lot of investors tend to stay away from them. So they like to listen to you speak about banks. So we're going to talk okay. about banks and I want to talk a little bit about, we always talk about things that you like to see like, in banks. Like, yeah. So maybe generally we can talk <laughs> about things that would. And it'll be general, general because yeah. I don't talk specifically about ones that I don't like in particular with banks. Yeah. You've read books about shorting and stuff. Yeah. Things like banks, insurers, and stuff are very sensitive to people saying negative things about their stock. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because, you know, you could give like a snap judgment away, right? So on the podcast, actually, last one we did on banks, you said if the current CEO of a bank was mm -hmm. around in 2008 right. and took a bath in 2008, yeah. that's not a bank that you would ever want to be interested in today. So that's like a quick snap judgment, just a quick filter, which, right. full disclaimer, of course, we'll probably miss out on banks but if you want to think about this like probabilistically over a, a hundred bets we want to make sure that the the outcome will be favorable over those 100 bets right so investing is a selective game so that's yeah. something like a small heuristic that you typically think through well like yeah i mean i bank. think the question was basically what if they were at the bank they needed to be bailed out because or they basically lost all their yeah. equity and stuff during that time and uh yeah i wouldn't rec i wouldn't buy into that i don't think i was looking at one recently and on the surface everything looked great and then I read how, you know, the 2008-2009 statements were for the company. I can't imagine a situation where I invest in a company run by people who had basically run a bank or insurer into the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, failure in that kind of thing is different than your, your business model didn't work or didn't get traction or something for some. I, I wouldn't necessarily, because you have a couple bankruptcies in internet companies that you tried to create, um, not invest in an internet company that's now a big success today that you run. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very different with those sorts of businesses, yeah. And you have said banks and insurance are the only two industries okay. that you can invest basically at like a startup level without seeing any financials or anything like that if you had a successful CEO from a different bank or insurance company that was going to go and do it themselves. Well, yeah, I meant me personally. When people ask about like venture capital type investments, yeah. if I had to do one, you know, they were talking about betting on the person. It would be in banking or insurance. Sure, it would. Because I think it does magnify the um, effect that the top individuals have on the company. So I do think that management is very important in terms of making decisions about certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that'd be true also with investment bank or something. I just don't know enough about investment banking to be able to have any confidence in that. But you know, if people left one bank to start another one themselves or something like that, yeah. So when Buffett talks about banks, he always gives, you know, pretty much the same things, I guess, if you will, on what he likes about banks. And he always says, you know, if a bank doesn't do dumb things on the asset side, it will make good money. Assuming that the bank's efficient, has the right people running and stuff, really banks right. get into trouble on the asset side when they start to, you know, make bad loans or stuff like that. So I'm kind of curious, like, what would you classify as doing dumb things? Like, what are some things... I know you come across a tons of banks, especially okay. in the OTC market, you know, yeah. pond. What are things that immediately stand out to you for you to be like, eh, next? 
The biggest one is taking excessive amounts of risk in the late stages of something, following other people in, being the last one into it, feeling we need to get into this, um, you know, that you need to dance while the music's playing or whatever, um, those sorts of things. Yeah. Getting into businesses in which you don't have any history of uh, experience and understanding of the losses in it, um, and in particular, in which it seems to not be a great time to get into it, right? So there should be signs that now would not be the time to get in. It's a little different if you're trying to get into something in which maybe everyone else is pulled out and stuff now. Um, then you're thinking, well, maybe we'll do this. You know, Berkshire thought about, okay, well, maybe we'll do municipal bond insurance or something at a point where they knew that there was less capacity for that from others. Um, that's a little different. You still don't have the history of that, but that makes more sense. You don't want to get into a hot business later on in time um number one thing though is is promising a certain growth rate number one definitely is a eps will grow 10 percent a year okay then yeah. we don't buy this this bank or yeah. this insurer or because something. that could incentivize them to make some dumb loans well and also i can pick what the eps is yeah i mean as long as my uh, my i mean d different people at the organization will agree with me but basically i mean you can look at insurers look how much from year to year reserves developments uh, change and stuff you know so you're making decisions about things that actually aren't tied up to this year we talked about with banks this year a bunch of banks had uh, big banks very big banks not not the smaller banks we invest in um had very had a very bad quarter early in covid and then a good quarter later that's what the headlines were yeah but the truth is they took a lot of reserves yes that, that they <laughs> added they a lot to, to reserves yeah. and then they said oh we didn't need all these reserves yeah. right and so that has an effect because you decide what those reserves will be um and you have certain discretion with that you certainly have a lot of discretion with timing mm -hmm. you know we've talked about that with um a few companies uh i believe in the book i think it's mentioned in that the um uh david einhorn book uh the fool some people fooling all, all some, the people some of the time, some of the time. right yeah. yeah um so in that one i think they do mention it at one point that another company there was i think it's that book they were talking about some other company shorting them or something which was uh i think it was auto or something like that but this is a good example of what can happen there so what a company can do is have some discretion on stuff that you want to look for and and read about and get an idea of what might be happening. And so an example either from that book or somewhere else that I was thinking of is that a, um, if, a, if a borrower was making any payment on a loan, uh, the company was saying that that payment, if it had happened within the last 30 days, um, meant that, they, that the asset was performing. So what would happen is if they weren't being paid for several months in a row and they had a balance that they owed $1,000, right? Mm -hmm. And they made a $100 token sort of payment on it, then they would say that that um, loan was still performing, right? That it was still earning interest. And so it was- Not like write it down? Yeah. And so that was a company that wasn't a bank because see, a bank would have uh, regulators and stuff that would say that you have to do that. And so the same thing we talked about statutory stuff with an insurer. So, you know, you have things with banks and insurers that are a little more, um, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with being some of these other businesses that are, we, we talked about car mart or something. So they're not regulated in the same way. They're, mm -hmm. They have regulation to protect consumers and stuff, but they're not regulated in how you classify certain things. Yeah, and so like when, there's more leeway. Yeah. yeah. And so when we talked about car mart, one of the things that I stressed is it's very important they contact the borrower and start taking actions very, very early. And that there's situations where that isn't the case. Um, I know of a situation where someone was... Uh, from an auto lender, I won't say who it was, but it's the opposite of a car mart, right? So it's a really big lender, not close to who's borrowing and not a lot of information on that and just, you know, one of the biggest in the industry. And uh, they the car was totaled and it took them two years to say, oh, here's a lawsuit and we're trying to recover this money and stuff. Well, what do you think the odds are they're ever going to get anything on that? What, you know, how did you find that out? How did I find that out? That there was a car that was... Is it just you knew generally that they were doing that? No, no, no. I, and if, or a specific could, example? A specific example. And oh. not only that, I suspect that what happened is they did not know that about their car. Oh, okay. And that it only happened because they pull certain legal 
uh, I think what happened was a legal action happened related to something else related to the car, and that's the only reason that tipped them off at all to it. Uh, but my point is, you know, people can think about that. Um, or no, another example is like skip risk with a car, right? So one thing that happens with cars is. Um, so I invested in a company that one of the things they did is they insured skip risk. So they insure the collateral for the uh, lender. So one of the things the lender has to be careful about is if you're you, – in car market's a good example of this, right? So if you have cars that you've loaned out to people, it's kind of like a junk bond. You expect a high default rate, but you expect a good recovery on that. Um, so on equities, if equities go – to uh, equities, a stock's going to go to zero basically when the stock enters bankruptcy. Your your recovery will be zero, but on junk bond, your recovery could be forty percent. All right, so it could default, but you still get back forty percent, and that's what keeps you alive over time. And these things is the how limited your downside is that way. So for these car loans, when someone defaults on a car loan, you get back the car, and in many cases, you do okay with that if if you you know um, with how much you recover, but if you lose the car because the person takes it from Georgia and drives into Florida with it, now you're not getting the car back. So your loss is 100%. Mm. And so some companies will have a lower loss frequency that they have, but the magnitude of loss is very big because of that risk that they have right there. And many companies may not be able to evaluate skip risk that well. Um, that you know, whereas you could in a face-to-face situation, so like a Carmart type situation, right? If there are people who are fairly local and the loans being made by someone right there in the community, yeah, you should be able to differentiate between people skipping and people who won't. I know that Carmart, as an example, had very different loss experiences in rural Oklahoma then on the outskirts of DFW. Hmm. And they went, oh, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the reason, Pack it in. the reason is that it's a very different kind of person that you're selling the cars to and you're making the loans to. And so an understanding the, the community is helpful that way, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're doing it, when you're making loans to people for, for basic transportation cars that they can't get access to credit in an area where unemployment's almost nothing, growth is very fast, whatever, like DFW area, the quality of the people that you're lending to is very low compared to a deeply impoverished area that's rural, where some of the people you're selling um, used cars to and stuff there are actually going to work very hard to pay off your loan. Mm -hmm. Their problem is that there's no opportunity in the area. It's much better to lend to people in an area where there's no opportunity, but they're very credit worthy, than to say, here's an area where there's a ton of opportunity. Let me find the 5% worst credit risk and let me make all my car sales to them. Mm -hmm. You'd rather make it where everyone's a bad credit risk because the community is in a constant state of recession, you know? How would you evaluate a bank that lends primarily to like CNI? Yeah. I mean, um, because those are typically bigger loans. I think it's a. I like that more risky. A little, loans. I like that business a little bit better. Yeah. Than like. residential. Well, here's the thing. So it's like insurers and stuff. We've talked about this a little bit. Yeah. Um, what's your advantage going to be? Okay. Um, I'm a little when I read write ups of Value Investors Club or all those sorts of things, um, Corner Berkshire and Fairfax things people tell me about. They focus a lot on the numbers, right? Yeah. But then you have to break down. You have to do a kind of Dupont analysis. What are the actual risks that they're taking, and how might they be taking more risks than other people are taking? Um, and so, or is there something that they're doing to make money in a different way? Um, my problem is that in if you're you know, if you're buying loans, like let's say you're buying mortgage loans, right? That are residential mortgage loans that conform to what everyone else could buy. So you're buying that commodity and yet you're having higher returns than other people. How are you doing that? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? It could be a lot of financial engineering and things like that. Do I see a little more opportunity for to be more efficient in some ways doing CNI lending? Yeah, I do. It's a little bit more specialized. I mean, it's more specialized. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, and you're often in a area in which you have, can have pretty high market share. It depends, but some of these have pretty high market share among, if you define the market as like businesses of a certain size in a community, then actually you may be surprised how big these banks are. That, you know, a third of all the uh, lending going on in that city for 
whatever we want to call it, small businesses that are big enough to to need large loans but are not public companies and things like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it could be a pretty big part of the market share there. It's kind of like underwriting or something. I think that there's some experience that you could be gained there. Do I think that there is much in other... I mean, look, anything that's guaranteed by the government, you don't have uh, an advantage in terms of your lending versus someone else's, right? Mm. Um we, we've talked about that before, and I feel the same way in insurance. There are certain things in insurance that I would rather be in, and they tend to be a little bit more specialty stuff um, than the more general stuff. I would just be skeptical of more general things. If you, you know, if your balance sheet was all a bunch of mortgages like we talked about, or, or as an insurer, you were writing all life insurance for individuals, not group stuff and whatever, I'd be like, can't we figure out how to do that? Right. Mm -hmm. But skip risk. Can someone figure out how to do that? I don't think so. I think the first year you'd lose a lot of money potentially, or you wouldn't know how to price it. You price it way too high and and you you just, just not a risk that you understand. So I think, you know, I do like CNI lending that way. There's some problems with CNI lending, especially in this environment, which you can see with like frost is a good example. Um, The loans tend to get paid back to you faster than you'd like, you know, the interest rate is so high. Um, no, 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 because um, they're bar, they're not financing, like, for instance, what you'd want, they I get. They are short-term loans as right. well. So you yeah. do, and they have lots of working capital and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like when we talked about agricultural things that way. In theory, the people who are going to always, always have demand for long-term money are like um, real estate, like real estate development, right? So they don't have a lot of working capital. That's always going to be their problem. They're always going to want to invest in another project, do those sorts of things. And so their loans are going to be very long. Even with individuals, you could say, okay, well, they could want a long-term mortgage, but they don't want a bunch of them. They just want one. I mean, like, think about it, if you have that relationship. You're like, okay, well, can we have you buy an office building stuff? Maybe you yeah. can. You know, can we have you buy a house? Okay, can we have you buy a vacation house? I mean, <laughs> how far can we go with this? Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. You, if you're a multi-billionaire, you're still. What do you have? Ten million dollars in loans? I mean, you can't. Yeah. You can't be some huge amount for consumption purposes of real estate. It just mm-hmm. can't happen. Um, the CNI stuff, it can be big, but it gets paid back very fast. And it gets paid back very fast, unfortunately, in good times. You know, like w- what we've seen in the last 10 years sometimes, which is the business produces some profits, cash profits, but doesn't have a big need to expand. So they've had that problem. And we've talked to banks before with the, that with CNI, which they've said, they just have not seen anything like this the last 10 years and yeah. all the years they've been in banking. There just isn't enough loan demand mm-hmm. for, uh, for businesses that they don't have enough demand for it. They would like to make more loans than they are. When you're analyzing a bank, how much of the demographics of the town that the bank is in is important to you? And let's say you're going to look at like a community bank where maybe they have like six or seven branches, you know, throughout different parts of the country. Um, you can pull up a lot of this stuff on certain uh, sites that track this data. I don't think it's a problem to be in a really rural area or something that's not as attractive. I know lots of people write up where they say it's a benefit to have the geography that, you know, you're in a sunbelt state and people's incomes are higher yeah. on average here and all that. It's certainly a benefit for a bank to have more deposits per branch, more deposits per employee, all those sorts of things. But mm-hmm. there's competition. For efficiency reasons. Yeah, but there's competition. So I, this is the same thing I said with supermarkets, right? It is good to have higher GDP per square mile around your bank. Now, this is less important now than it used to be because now we're having more online things. COVID will probably change this even more, but still, no matter what. So yes, it's better to be in a town where there's a lot of rich people in that town, right? Um let's say Bermuda has like 60,000 people, Little Island, and the average person's got some insane per capita income, like $100,000 or something crazy. So yeah, you'd rather have a bank there. Was that NT Butterfield? That's one of the banks there, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you'd rather have that than have um, a lot of competition. So the thing is it tends to even out. So if you look at like where I grew up in New Jersey, so I think it would be a great place to have a bank, but there's lots of competitors i can name several of them they like to go into that area and then when you go into more rural areas it's not like someone's been looking to open banks in buffalo Uh, you know in terms of buffalo's population probably relative population wealth to the country probably peaked 70 years ago something like that 1950 i would guess so in a sense it's been a relatively unattractive demographic it's kind of the reverse of the sunbelt right Mm -hmm. so 
Yeah, it's attractive if other people, if competition isn't moving in faster. That's the problem is when competition moves in faster. So we, you know, anytime we're going to invest in a bank, it's going to be more probably like a a smaller, specialized, maybe a regional one branch type of bank, right? How would you handicap Mm -hmm. like a Wells Fargo or a Bank of America where they just do so many different things? In those, I think that the more quantitative stuff does work pretty well. Um, But it's difficult because you can't evaluate some of the risks that they're taking. I think I said that I looked into one of the banks and I was concerned about like, I don't know. I, I didn't feel I could understand some of the interest rate risk that they were taking with some stuff. They're very complicated. Um, you have to take their word for it. But on the other hand, they could lose a lot of money and they'd be fine. So you could have disaster. You could, you could totally not understand their investment banking thing. They could have terrible disasters and then probably it'll be okay because the rest of the bank is so big that it won't cause a problem. Yeah. You know, the le- legal stuff. Uh, a smaller bank could be significant, but they could pay a huge settlement that they were involved in drug trafficking. It's like whatever, cost of doing business. And it's just what, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, same sort of thing. So it's, you know, that's the settlements that they have to make up for stuff in the last 10 years. They've p- all paid lots of settlements for things that they'd done in the past. There'll probably be some settlements over the, all the SPAC stuff and things later, um, you can imagine. So, you know, it's part of what the business is. I wonder, is there anything that, so it's uh, other than maybe giving EPS guidance, is there anything where if you owned a bank already and they made some sort of shift, is there anything that would stick out to you be like, I do not like this anymore? Yeah. Is it the type of lending they start to do or? Right. So I generally don't like lending into new areas they haven't been in before. Mm -hmm. It's a really big problem. Now, banks have to do it. Eventually, Eventually, at some point in their growth, they do have to kind of figure out a new place to Mm -hmm. go into and do it. Um, did they sort of follow their customers there? How similar is this market to the market they were in originally? How slowly do they do it? How slowly do it is a really big one. Yeah. You, you need some to experience <laughs> of, yeah, you need some experience of, of um, yeah, that's important with all of these. They're very important in insurance, right? Yeah. Is to not write a lot fast um, so that they understand what they're doing. And is it something that's very fast growing and uh, others are already in? Um, but like I've talked about banks in Hawaii, a couple banks in Hawaii ruined themselves basically. And in each case it was by making loans off the, um, out, out of state. So they either went to California and lost a lot of money or they went to Asia and lost a lot of money. Those are the ways that they do it. So if, as long as they stuck to things in Hawaii, they didn't have those same problems, but they tended to be less aware of what was, I think they made dumber construction loans on the mainland than they would have made on their own island. So. Said, did they choose California because it's kind of comparable to yeah. Hawaii or Asia? Yeah. Yes. Both reasons because of that, because of similarities and because there would have been some people connected on each side from that. Yeah. I just wonder how you handicap, like, you know, how much um, risk there is to the general economy in the area. So like Hawaii, I would say there's a tremendous risk there, right? There was, is it Silicon Valley Bank, right? Very tied to, yeah. they had issues in the past as well. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, that could be a big opportunity. So I did look at Frost when they had, when they had, um, where people were concerned somewhat about energy loans, right? I think that having um, Buffett bought Wells Fargo when there was a big downturn in uh, real estate in California. I'm more concerned with, there being risky loans like for the long term that we don't understand well higher leverage than would be appropriate for those sorts of things um stuff like that then that there's going to be a bad result this year that could actually be a good opportunity to buy into it when they have like a bath take a bath yeah. or something yeah, yeah a lot because i feel most investors focus on that yeah so they go okay how much so they say things like like say energy's down the last year they'd say like uh, last year they would have said how much is tied to energy but that could be the time to look for a good bank that had done energy lending. Mm-hmm. And, by the, and you know, it wasn't actually that dangerous because it hadn't been that long that prices were very high. The thing that makes danger in most of these lending th- categories for these companies is that there's a long period where they, a long enough period where they make loans that don't work for the long term. So if you have oil go to 120 and then to 40 in a year, that's different than if it averaged 80 to 120 for five years or something. See, if that happened, then you do have a lot more danger. Um, and if they were growing the percentage of their lending overall that was tied to energy for a long period of time, you know, that's kind of the concern. I've said that with Farmer Mac. 
Uh, I think it's a, it, it, the kind of the actual core business they do now. Their charter allows them to creep into other things over time, but the actual farm and ranch lending mm-hmm. uh, for mortgage sounds like a good business to me. It sounds like a safer kind of loan than I think most people think it is. But I also think that a couple times every century there will be a farm bubble so big it will wipe out any government sponsored entity that's the that enterprise that's in that um, business. Mm-hmm. Just like I think it'll happen in housing. I think there's you there's often a housing bubble big enough that the idea of Fannie and Freddie they will go under. You can't stop, you know. It's very hard to stop these things from riding into a bubble. Mm-hmm. And you know that when we've talked about things where I, we were someplace uh, looking at a bank and I said, "Well, is this a bubble?" And then you know, let's look around and stuff. There's because a lot of cranes out the, there. <laughs> the hardest thing for a for a bank to survive yeah. is a bubble in their home in their um, home market. Yeah, I think that is hard. Oh, what sure. do you do? Well, that's why I talk about Silicon Valley. You right. start to believe in that kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, and it can get that absurd. Um, and most most um, banks have never been in areas that to see how crazy it could get. You know, like Japan is a good example. So, like Japan in around 1990, that's like real. That's a bubble. You know, that's what a bubble looks like. The housing bubble is an example for. Um, the U.S. or the dot-com bubble. But those things have a different feel than what most banks experience, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like the the housing bubble, they're they're bubbles in little ways locally for some banks, but there isn't a national thing all working together that way like there was. Um, So you could think that you were making, you know, I mean, like to take that example with mortgage stuff, you could just think that mortgages are safe for a very long time. You just could really believe that house prices don't really go down nationally Mm -hmm. and if you believe that then that could become a problem if you give people what they're looking for i mean that's the other thing is like the whatever you want to call the adverse selection issue or whatever that we talk about with um insurers but also investment bank things whatever is just like you can get into the belief that you just give people what they're looking for and you can't do that oh it's like financing um Trailer park homes, right? There's company that has companies that have blown up because of that too. Well, that's a success that Berkshire has. I mean, the re- I think the real story, and Buffett said this a little bit, but the whole real story of clean homes is that everyone else made uh, it, it's just capital. Yeah, well, they can I mean, rely and, on Berkshire. Berkshire yeah. Well, yeah, but even before that, they had a lot more success than others for that reason, and then Berkshire provided that. But it's not just because of Berkshire. It's it's just that. Um, Access to capital across a cycle is critical in that business, you know. Well, because immediately once you move in, the value of like a trailer park goes down or uh, a trailer home. Sure. Yeah, it goes down. And the the type of demographic that typically purchases trailer parks, if they're underwater, they're okay just completely. I'm generalizing, but from this book that I read when they're talking about it, they would be less inclined to. Uh, you know, pay on that mortgage or, you know, they're okay with claiming bankruptcy, stuff like that. The resale value of a trailer park home is a yeah. lot less. No, no, no. I, but I don't think there's anything wrong with financing um, trailers. I don't think there's a wrong with fin- financing manufactured homes at all. I think the only issue there is people thinking that mortgages between the two have some similarity. Um, and they don't. I don't even know necessarily that it's a better investment decision for someone to own a home than to own a manufactured home that way. No, no, we've talked about but that. But I think that um, you can't view the mortgages as having the same safety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But also there's a it's high... actually a great value to buy a manufactured home. Yeah. Yeah. But there's actually a, a um, extreme amount of cyclicality, which is part of what we're talking about here. And there's some incentives that weren't so good. Yeah. So, you know, that the desire for people to, um, I mean, your production is financed. That's always dangerous on any of those businesses. That's always a problem that you have is if you're making money off the financial products, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or if you need financing to sell the products that you make, then you have this problem where uh, you're going to put people in the homes that probably shouldn't be in them which is a little bit different than other kinds of banking that we're talking about where the bank is not tied to something else i mean when we talk about karma that's a critical thing to keep in mind karma has to be careful that way not to think um i mean from a retail perspective selling more cars per lot is good definitely if analysts start thinking well selling 40 cars per lot instead of 30 is what we want to do 
okay. But then you've just created 40 loans instead of 30, yeah. which doesn't sound that bad, except you created 10 loans that you otherwise wouldn't have created. So are these, the quality of those marginal Juice loans those really, up a little bit. really poor? Yeah. Is the quality really Why poor? Why does it matter right? if you sell it off, though? Package it together. Sure. Sell it to the next and, and that's the difference. Carmart doesn't do that. Yeah. What did Munger say this year? Wall Street will continue to sell. Yeah. Dog shit as long as it's whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's a risk. And so other other companies compete with Carmart and have mm-hmm. had more success and grown faster because they use some sort of um, either securitization mm-hmm. or they use something where other people are making the loans and they're doing sort of a blanket. Um, anything that conforms, they'll take. And then they borrow money and stuff on the other side. But um, that can work and then they have to be careful about how they do that but so those aren't your employees so it's kind of like using agents mm-hmm. uh they're highly incentivized now they do things with them to try to get them to have skin in the game or however you want to say it for that this loan won't go bad but the rest of their business is highly incentivized to closing the transaction so they are more likely to want to sell uh, a car and create this loan to make cash up front now, you know, in those situations, which is a little different than Carmart. And they're not employees of your your own employees that you can control as well. So, but some companies have done fine with that. I've seen some and noticed that over time, they focus more on higher volume at fewer locations. Mm-hmm. So they lose a lot of, uh, whether we want to call them agents or whatever, the people who are actually underwriting the loans. What about banks that rely on like money markets? For like source of capital. Yeah, so this like is that. the biggest concern that I have generally. Um, all all the ones that we would be interested in, they use deposits. Yeah, that's true generally. Um, <sighs> there's different kinds of deposits and different levels of stickiness to that. Yeah, um, yeah we can I, dive into that too. Yeah. I could talk you know, about banks all day long. I uh, love it. The, the, in the financial crisis, there was much more reliance on wholesale stuff. Over mm-hmm. time, you were seeing it go up and up more. And so that's a concern that I would have. Um, especially lots of things of these things that people say are like a bank, but they aren't actually a bank. Um, business development stuff, right? So business development stuff is, is they'll say, is a lot like a bank. Um, but they're often going to rely on money uh, from the outside that they need. Um, you know, I... That's the stuff that dries up. We went through the Lehman 10K or whatever, right? Mm. Uh, that's what we did, yeah. And, you know, I said, look how fast the balance sheet is growing, you know, for some of these items, and that's a big concern. You saw items are up 50% and yeah. stuff. That's a really big concern. And then how do you find the funding for that when you do that? And what if it starts going in the opposite direction? Uh, but, you know, that's a wider thing that we talk about with all sorts of things. I mean, why did GE get into the trouble they got into? One of it is that they didn't back up their um, commercial paper program. So they had a commercial paper program and they didn't have a credit line big enough to um, to borrow to handle the, not issuing any commercial paper. So a lot of companies historically had said, okay, if I have $5 billion of commercial paper, that's going to be um, out there. I'm normally going to be saving money But I'm also going to have this credit line for $5 billion because then if I don't have access to commercial paper, I now draw down that credit line and I have the same amount of money. My balance sheet doesn't have to shrink. But the easiest way to do it, but that, by the way, comes with a commitment fee and stuff and other things. And it would have to be a really big credit line that people would know about. Um, The easiest thing is to just assume like the reliability that you'll have now. We we talked about this a little bit with energy stuff and what we can talk about now because we talked about NACO before. when people ask questions about if there's a future for coal and natural gas and nuclear and all that, the reason why there might be some part of the grid that maintains um, those sources all the time is for this very reason we're talking about here. The easiest thing to do, right, is to the cheapest, most efficient, most green thing to do would be to have all wind, right, or something like that. But people understand that you can't rely on it at all times. And that's the concern with banks, with any finance things that way, that there's always a temptation, right, to rely on other people's money still being there and not to take precautions that cost you a little bit more today to even out the risks that you're taking over time and especially what they would be under extreme circumstances. So when you look at this stuff like having 
fewer deposits relative to your balance sheet, mm -hmm. a fewer customer deposits, really sticky deposits, transaction sort of things. You know, we're talking like like for Frost or something like basically operating accounts of businesses are really sticky. So um, not having a lot of those, is it a big deal? It's not a big deal in normal times, right? Like when money's freely available, but in a crisis, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. You know, mm -hmm. all the investment banks could say that they didn't, they weren't really taking unusual risks, except at the point at which you have to rely on getting money from people and they don't want to give it to you. So I do, th that's kind of my biggest concern, probably. Number one, I do start with looking at the liabilities, not the assets of a bank. So I'd the say, type of deposits? Yeah, the deposits. Um, how big are they? Who are they really from, do I think? Um, do you like to see them in the form of CDs or no. operating businesses? No, not in the yeah. form of CDs, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, what are the and types to be of fair, deposits? people could say that any of these things, you can fix this problem. Of course, yeah. I mean, if it was all CD, you know, you as long as the assets were certain kinds of things, as long as it was matched up well with the liabilities that you had, and if you were super efficient. So could I imagine a business that's like an all internet business that's using CDs, that has assets that are much different in terms of what they look like than other banks? Yeah, there are other ways to do this and to do it in a business model that makes sense. I'm not saying you can't. But in general, what we're talking about is having Cus yes. I mean, would you rather it all be checking accounts of, of customers that you have that would likely keep their money with you no matter what the situation is and aren't that sensitive to like whether interest rates are a little higher one place or another? Aren't that sensitive to fees? You, you're charging them nothing or you're charging them $15 a month. They're probably still with you. Yeah. You know, yes, that's better. I just Definitely. wonder what Jeff Gannon's bank business model would be if you were to say, I'm going to go start a bank tomorrow. I think it's, I mean, I think the biggest help in the world is to have low cost sticky deposits sure <laughs> but it's really hard to have that yeah uh -huh. it's really hard to have that so, so i which mean means they, you probably need to specialize in something um yeah that might be the case yeah uh you need i mean to have that that's really hard because to have that you kind of have to be i mean it, it's a commodity business right people talk about it all the time but on both sides it's a commodity business yeah, really Buffett, munger have talked about that yeah but there are certain people for certain things that, you know, sure, yeah. I mean, you're probably not going to move business if you're satisfied in, in banking and insurance both. There's, there's not gonna, there, there, you're not gonna be hunting for m making a little bit more interest, paying a little bit less in fees, um, things like that, probably. For a lot of customers. So you, if, if you already have the customer base and they're pretty happy, then you're going to do okay with that. Um, I think that certain kinds of customers are maybe a little bit more likely to be sticky. And that's what I talked about with the CNI stuff. Like high net worth customers, business? So high net worth. I mean, we talked about this. So I think pri private um, banks and CNI you love private banks, banks, I think, yeah. are the two best for the potential to create a nice match between your deposits and your lending. The problem that most banks are gonna have is can you get low cost sticky deposits? I think so. <laughs> are those same customers gonna want loans? No. The people who are gonna be the low cost sticky deposits are not the people who are gonna want loans. Yeah, uh -huh. And you can also create, a, a, and you can have a big loan business with no nice deposits on the other side. Yeah. The, I, the dream bank, of course, would be something that somehow manages to match both of those things off. That would be beautiful. Mm -hmm. That you have the same population that you know, some people are going to want to be short money and some people are going to be want to be long money, right, at all times. And through that, you're basically just reallocating resources among a population that you have a network, whatever you want to call it, a network of people and stuff that wants all that at the same time. Um, like it, it evens out, however you want to say it. It keeps it in a state that's stable over time generally. And then there's not a lot that you have to change. A lot of, I mean, think about it. Let's say you became really popular among um, people who wanting consumer loans, right? Okay, so they want loans to like, um, because they're really concerned with having the lowest cost on that or because you could do loans that are maybe a little riskier or whatever, you have some better way of figuring it out, whatever it might be. Well, well couldn't these all be younger people who don't have enough money saved up and whatever? And, and, and it's not that they're taking high risks or whatever, but how are you gonna get deposits from them, mm -hmm. right? And then what if your deposit base is all like people who are, retired and you know 
how are you going to convince them to take a lot of loans from you? I mean, that's the model for banks when people talk about a textbook all the time. I find that usually there's a serious mismatch there. In mo- I've only found like one or two banks or something where I would say I'm really impressed with both sides of the bank equally that way. Um, that they've, you know, they're, that in a sense there's any kind of, um, I don't know how to explain it best, there's a network advantage to who their customers are. Let's think about it that way, You're saying customers, not borrowers or um, depositors. That, on a, in a sense, actually has benefits on both sides of the ledger. So when you talk about customers, like benefits to who the customers are, like what do you mean by that? Well, that's what I mean. In that, in a couple cases, there is a benefit both to being a depositor and a borrower, mm. and they even out quite a bit over time and things like that. But as I said, I found that that shows up mainly in private banking and CNI. Hmm. Yeah, those are the two where I'd say it's most likely. Um, high net worth, very high net worth individuals, households, and um, businesses do sometimes have significant needs both in ter- uh, at different times in terms of how much they'll deposit with you and stuff like that, but also do have opportunities to be lending them a lot of money. Whereas I think for a lot of um, the general public, let's say, I don't think that there's enough of a match between those things. You can see that in some of the banks we've talked about. Okay, Frost. We've talked about how they have a bunch of securities. One way to think about it is they have a deposit business that is both from um, uh, that's both businesses and households. Okay, but they're only able to to use half their balance sheet normally in lending that they think makes a lot of sense for them as a business lending. Now they could do consumer lending, but they don't really. And so in a sense, they buy a bunch of securities and stuff with the rest of their balance sheet. Um, And the reason they do that is because there's not that right match that we're talking about here. Basically they can get deposits from people who want. So like say they're focused on, they're getting people who want a bank in Texas where there's like human interaction that answers the phone and, and gives you some customer service and whatever. Mm-hmm. Maybe they want an app or something like that too. So that sort of thing. What they get to attract from those people is just the deposit side of it. Um, because like it's commodity, it's a transaction thing to do the mortgage. I mean, I'm sure they could try to convince you. I mean, they don't do it, but they have some things where they let other people do it for them to try to keep it, kind of retain the customer. But um Ultimately, I think that's just a, there's not a non-commodity aspect to that that we're talking about mm-hmm. when they borrow from you. Um, I mean, Frost said that in some earnings call things where they're like, you know, for certain loan sizes, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if, if, if you're doing a $250 million loan, you, <laughs> whatever the relationship is, that helps you get an opportunity to say, here's our offer in terms of the terms of what we want. But if someone else says, uh, "Here's, uh, we're, we're going to be willing to do this for a lower interest rate, or we're going to be willing to do this for kind of looser standards in some ways or whatever, they're going to get the business. Mm-hmm. No one's going to do that based on a relationship thing when you get up to that size, you know, which is different from what they have on uh, when they're um, the CNI lending that they do for smaller businesses and things like that. And they're even a step up from some of the others we see that are even somewhat smaller banks than something like Frost. Across the regional bank, when you get down to the level of like a bank focused almost mostly in one county or something, mm-hmm. you can be even more attractive that way. I'd say the relationships are closer that way. It's a smaller bank, but a lot of them run into the problem we just talked about that they're not both sides. There, I find that there's usually an advantage on one side or the other, and I think the deposit side is if you're going to have a non-commodity type thing, I guess that's the more attractive one that you have. I think most of Buffett's investments focus on that side. There are arguments for other advantages too, though. I mean, I have noticed if you look, we did some reports. Wells Fargo did average higher yields adjusted for um, losses and stuff. Net of their losses and stuff, they were able to keep making loans at higher um, returns than some other banks did. You know, you can see that Frost never was able to do it at the levels some other banks were. So some people could say that there are advantages on the lending side too. Buffett didn't talk at all about Wells Fargo or banks in general. Yeah, well, he's out of Wells Fargo, right? Yeah. Yeah, he didn't talk about banks, yeah. He's big in Bank of America. Yeah. 
Um, but he's been selling out of some other things. It's so funny because, like, I guess, you know, even when we first started Focus Compounding, I think banks would probably make me fall asleep. But now I think they're one of the most interesting companies in the, like to study. Okay, so talk to the people about that. Why is that? I think because I didn't understand them. Banks I kept are, I think stressing banks are the very, importance of learning about banks. Yeah, and I think that's the best place to start because I think if you could figure out a bank and a finance company, you could figure out probably, like, a lot of the companies you come across. They're very complicated companies i feel like and it's yeah. kind of opposite to the way you think about like the financial statements and stuff i mean but it's great once you learn you know one bank in and out it's you know obviously um it's easier to figure out other banks but i just think they're one of the best industries around quite frankly so i i find banks and insurers are interesting things to study uh, for investors and, and Buffett owned insurers right away and owned a bank for as long as he could uh, because it gives you like the purest form of thinking about capital allocation and management and those kinds of things. There's not a lot they can hide behind. Um, they, you know, they're, you can show them your bank is leveraged less than this other bank or leveraged more. Okay. Um, you can be look at it and say, okay, your reserves have, you know, been insufficient clearly if we look at the development over time for several years in a row or something what is it why do you keep getting this wrong and stuff whereas there's a lot more to hide behind with the bigger companies they keep missing some target or something it's very easy to mm-hmm. ignore that fact that they're doing that they can change what they're talking to you about that way a lot of the capital allocation can be kind of disguised that way with um with banks insurers i think it's a very pure form of that to think about where do you get your return from what price are you paying is it acceptable price to pay um, so I think it's, it, to me, it's very interesting. No, I think it's, I, I agree. Yeah, it's, yeah. It took me a little bit, but I agree. <laughs> but what's also interesting is, um, like when we talk about, uh, you sent me a, a, um, link where Buffett was answering a question about why do banks have lower PE multiples than other mm-hmm. uh, I tweeted businesses. It too. And yeah. this was from 20 some years ago or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I always find that interesting when people say something like that. Like um, it was sort of like when we were talking about the utilities, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to mention that because Buffett says this in the letter, but I don't think people really appreciate this. Berkshire Hathaway Energy, um, that business has retained so it's a it does non-recourse borrowing i think the same as burlington northern but burlington northern has always paid dividends to berkshire um berkshire hathaway energy has never paid dividends yeah, it retains everything it retains it doesn't Which take money from, from berkshire utility. it doesn't take money from berkshire but it's yeah. reinvested and so over time it's compounded like 17 percent a year or something right yeah Can yeah we say that, that? Yep. yeah so this is fascinating right because in a sense here's this growth company over a long period of time that got really big and it's a utility but people would say, well, utilities can't be a growth company. Well, a bank can't be a growth company. It can't if it pays those dividends. But if it retains everything, it could be. Mm-hmm. You know. And so when we talk about things like the multiples, I agree 100%. If a bank is paying out 80% of its earnings and dividends, as some banks might be doing, then it can't have a very high P multiple probably because you can only create value with that extra 20% that you're retaining. Yeah. The, otherwise, you're just valuing it on the dividend yield. But there's some banks that don't pay very high dividends. Um, and there's no rule that says they have to do that. And mm-hmm. as we talked about when we did the talk about insurance things, I've always thought that some insurers would have been better off if they had focused less on dividends and more on financial strength early on. That they could have given themselves a, a situation as Berkshire did where the, you have more freedom in what to invest in everything. So like like portfolio of stocks? Yes. Like that. Yeah. One re- big reason why insurers can't copy Berkshire to some extent is wanting to report earnings um a certain way which is much easier with a bond portfolio but also things like meeting certain standards in terms of their financial strength and stuff while also paying your dividends Mm -hmm. see they could quickly meet it if if some of these companies if they said we're not gonna pay a dividend for the next three years they'd really have a lot of financial strength but if you want to pay out most of your earnings and dividends then you know the am best and stuff is going to be you're going to not be able to take a lot of risk and still have that kind of strong rating because they know you're not going to cut your dividend um so with banks you know we talk about the pe multiples the price to book i've generally favored banks where the price to book is not the main attraction for buying into them yeah know? buffett even says here is that you may have to pay three times tangible equity to buy a great bank uh He's, he talks about paying up uh well when what year was that that he said that 2005 okay yeah that's true mm-hmm no, that that's true. Because I mean, but I've you've always talked about though how most investors they want to buy companies that have like a low price to book. And our we don't do that. 
I mean, I mean I'd like to. I'd, I'd yeah, love to get a low price to. to book. But if you yeah. mean if I sorted <laughs> banks by highest to lowest, yeah. I think a low price to book is potentially very attractive versus a medium price to book, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I don't think that's a problem. I think that like that mean reversion that a somewhat okay, uh, uh, a bad bank could become an okay bank, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of value investors bet on. I agree with that. And, and more than that, another bank will want to acquire them. So I'm not knocking the idea of low price to book at all. Yeah, I think that that's a could be a good place to look for mean reversion to the mean. I'd like to see about. a back tested study on that. I think Nate Tobik has probably done stuff like that. Like yeah, if you bought like a basket of like twenty like low price to book. Right. Well, we could talk about why value why do value investors not like banks? And I have a few theories on this. So one of my theories is that the things you tend to look for as a value investor are exactly those things which could lead to disaster in banking and insurance, I think, too, actually. Um, so the ones that people always talk about, high dividend yield, right? Low price to book, low PE. But you have to understand that if you're looking at a bank with those qualities right now, probably the reason it is that way is because investors have concerns about their asset quality. Yeah, something, yeah. Yeah, that's probably what it is. So... And not only their asset quality, but it could potentially be they even have problems with what their earnings are today that they're not reserving sufficiently now. So um, you can see that with different banks, whereas if they're willing to pay up premiums and they're much more positive on other things. But it could be uh, those factors. And so some investors may get, value investors might get hurt on that basis. Then we have the mean reversion thing, which is interesting, where value investors like to bet on mean reversion. And it works if that's what the problem is that the bank has. Um, but so like I've said, I said that before and that's what I did with Frost basically and some other ones. That's another reason for BOK Financial, mm -hmm. Bank of Oklahoma. So yeah. I had two, I wrote about a bunch of different regional banks and actually two of them are some of the biggest energy lenders. And you say that would be stupid and I don't have a opinion about the macro of oil being higher or whatever, but I felt they were good enough lenders. I felt their financial strength was strong enough. I felt that they weren't overwhelmingly in those areas. So that, I, I mean, most people, I think, looking at them never said, oh, they're going to face some risk of uh, insolvency or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the peak for Frost, if I remember, was maybe 16% of their loan portfolio, which would be 8% of their balance sheet, maybe, So uh, because their securities are the other side of the balance sheet. So let's say even if it was 15 or 20%, we're talking 10% or less, in energy loans. And then a small portion of that is like oil field services, which could definitely go to zero. Much more of it is producing wells, which should have some value left sure. over to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, but that's the thing value. I just get interested in that. And that's what I did. I bought into something at the time when uh, that loan category was challenged. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's kind of the, it's always about the turnaround things with value investors. And, you know, my experience has been, they with banks, it's pro you probably don't want to go for those that the cigarette turnaround? puff. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. Have you ever seen a bank? BOK Financial, you know, he built that uh, Kaiser. He built. He he took over that bank and then built it from there. Well, there's a so, couple banks I could think of where yeah. they came back from the dead, but that's because somebody took them over, or like I mean, that, management. That's yeah. why, if you notice with BOK Financial, people look it up. You're like, why does an individual own? Like, uh, d d why is a bank like majority owned by an individual? Why is there a huge owner? That shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, it happened because it was basically a takeover of a troubled institution and turn it around. Um, and presumably that's why they focus on energy lending. Because mm -hmm. for people who don't know, his he, he made his fortune in oil. Uh, or natural gas, actually. That area, Oklahoma, Texas. Um, so focusing on what you know is a, n not a bad idea. Right. Yeah. Um, if you know, if I mean, if yeah, if someone didn't have a lot of banking experience, at least they have the experience of lending to an industry that they knew about. Um, but the, you know, uh, I yeah, I mean, turning them around. I don't know. I think it depends on what it is that the problem is. We've talked about this yeah. before, right? So like, you have to break it down and look at it. For me, mo the problem that most small banks that trade below price to book have is they're inefficient. And they're not going to get efficient unless they have a lot more scale. Mm -hmm. So if they merge with someone, then they can be immediately more efficient. But when people say like, um, you know, if, if you have a bank that's ne that's always earning 0.3% of assets or something because return on assets, because it has this overhead that it can't get out from under, then it, it needs to be taken over by someone else, you know. 
Um, because if it isn't, it's not going to grow fast enough to grow into that problem. So the efficiency. Um, the other efficiency problem is could be management. They're not running as efficiently. That's what I've seen. A lot of successful turnarounds. They make a run on the bank. Not in the sense of <laughs> taking the capital, but in booting out the management. Throwing out the management. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So that could be uh, that could be a solution to it. It, it. I've seen that more with insurers. Really? Uh, smaller insurers and yeah. stuff. Yeah, where their management's taking a lot of the... Uh, you mean paying themselves is a lot? Be, is it because of like... A lot of, I feel like, insurers in OTC land, it's like family-run businesses. If the price of the book is less than one, a lot of times it's yeah, family Well, so there's why. two aspects to that. One, they may be paying themselves a lot, right? Yeah. Okay. But then two, so why would a company end up with a low price to book as an insurer or something like that over time? So a few things. One, um, it actually has to be something fundamentally sound about their insurance operation, right? They've lasted a really long time to build up enough Mm-hmm. Uh, and and um, they turn a profit every year and whatever. It doesn't mean that they're particularly good at it or whatever, but they, they're not bad. Um, so there has to be a sound insurance operation in the middle of it. And then two is that they probably have to be overpaying themselves or it has to be inefficient in some way. Mm-hmm. And then three, and I think the most important one, is value investors have to believe there's no potential for a catalyst. The thing that really keeps the price to book down on these sorts of things is no catalyst. Mm-hmm. See, if a bank has almost no like major shareholders and stuff and it's trading way below price to book, they figure, well, someone in the area will offer more and they'll merge. And so that's my upside. Right, you're usually looking for the big pop in yeah. a low price to book. Right? Well, it's like that video that you referenced and that I tweeted about Buffett with mm-hmm. low P's. He's like, we just we don't think about you know any of that. It's really what's the business generating the cash return for you today, and what you think it could be in the future. And it's kind of like the free cash flow plus growth. Yeah, and b- and Berkshire invested in banks. Um, I think pretty heavily on the management side of it. They focused on people yeah. for management. I've said that before. They were invested in M and T Bank. I think that was purely because of who was running it. Um, things like that. Uh, Wells Fargo, I think that was true too. And May also explained some of the things later over time of Berkshire and that it didn't go Why so they well. Why they exited? Yeah. Why they exited. But I also think like that had a lot of faith in, um, they had a lot of faith in who was running the bank for a while and may have overlooked some things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, Wells Fargo is kind of a weird weird situation because not many banks are that incentivized to run things the way that they were to focus in on how, what they were doing and so they had those incentives for the accounts and everything which is a little odd different than most banks would be that way they're very retail focused think of themselves as like a retailer you know mm-hmm. um which is very they even talked about their banks as stores and things like that a lot of banks don't do that um so i mean the, i think that's the reason why Value investors don't like banks as much, I guess, is one possible reason. Historically, they like them a lot. So I think this is maybe it's a fairly new thing. I don't like a fintech. I don't feel like they disliked them that much before the bubble, to be honest. Hmm. I remember value investors talking a lot about banks and things in the, the pre bubble, right? So, like, uh, I don't want to say who they were and stuff, but some people like Washington Mutual, I remember very clearly and reading about them and all of that, what they liked about it, and some other banks. So I maybe it's mostly a 2008-on phenomenon mm-hmm. of value investors not like, liking banks. And then banks have made it hard for them because uh, the interest rate situation. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. So it hasn't been a strong performer for them for a long time. Got it. Cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a playlist on YouTube, and it's just going to say banks. So it's going to be every single episode we've ever done on banks because I love talking about banks. Jeff loves talking about banks. People listening love to hear... Uh, podcasts about banks. So it's all going to be there basically every single episode we've ever done. And we're going to continue to do episodes in the future. Like I said, I think it's one of the most interesting areas uh, yeah, for me to study. Yeah, maybe people ask more questions about banks. Yeah. yeah. I love that love learning about new banks. And there's just so many of them. So many Well, of that's them. the thing for, for us as investors that are really useful is that there's a lot of banks. Yeah. And so there's actually some differences in business models between them, some differences yeah. in management and all that. So when people ask, like, do I like banks? Generally, no. Mm-hmm. At any time. It's not an issue of, like, where we are in the cycle or whatever. Generally, no, because I think you can pick out the ones that you like best because mm-hmm. there's so many. Yeah. Um, Run any OTC screen and, like, 
two thirds of right. it will be banks. Right. Or anything just sub, let's say 300 million market cap. Mm. So you have micro caps, you know, and they're almost the only things that make money in that category. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, there's very few companies that have been around for a while making some money, aren't that big. And yet, um, uh, and yet, um, are available at a reasonable price and stuff like that. You know, um, but from, even if they're like earning high returns on equity, then you got to like break it down. Like you said, like, what are mm-hmm. they doing to earn that? Yeah. Maybe the best thing for most people would be, you can definitely find a bank in your area. Mm-hmm. I mean, a publicly traded bank in your state or something that would be very possible to do. And most people don't have that experience for other kinds of businesses. If you're going to, um, I don't know if you're going to analyze, you know, a real estate company or whatever, there are only a few people who have a publicly traded real estate company right in their area, but usually there'll be a bank. Mm -hmm. Um, If not in your county, then certainly in your state that you can look at, look at their public information on them, get a feeling for it. It it might help to have some, you know, that you get more of an understanding because you know the communities they're talking about Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning with both of us. Hit the subscribe button. Check out that new Banks playlist that I'm going to create on YouTube. Thank you so much for all the support, and we will see you in the next podcast.